Okay. I'm here with Randy Abramson, and uh, the date today is January 22nd. We're in uh, my home in Bethesda, and Randy has agreed to talk to me about her life. So thank you, Randy. Sure. All right, so let's just start at the beginning. Um, tell me about where you grew up and your, your childhood. Okay. Um, so I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, but I actually grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and that's where I lived from age two to age 18. Um, Toledo, Ohio um, is a couple things to me. Um, one of them is it's in the, I had an enormous number of family there. Um, so Your own family? My own family. Um, so my mom has um, three other siblings. They all were there in that same town. Um, and so all of, so my aunts, my uncles, all of my cousins were all in Toledo, so Toledo was a big family town for me. Um, and it's Midwest. T t t what was the level of Jewish observance in your home? So my home in particular, my mom was raised Reform, my dad was raised Orthodox. So we, of course, in Toledo there's three synagogues, one Orthodox, one Reform, one Conservative, and we were a Conservative. Okay. Um, so it was interesting because my mom had to do a lot of um, learning and shifting to make it comfortable for my dad. Um, so the level of observance, for, we had a kosher home. My mom had never had a kosher home growing up, didn't really know anything about being kosher, um, but she, she learned. Did you feel like a minority growing up in a, a, a town of the size of Toledo? Absolutely, huge influence on what I thought and who I was and what I, yeah, I went to the public high school um, and there were a handful of Jews there. Um, I have deep searing memories, for instance, in elementary school when they would say, um, we would be for months, or weeks, it felt like months, we'd be singing Christmas songs to get ready for the Christmas pageant. And then they, one day, they would, um, out of the blue, they'd say, well, all the Jewish kids, all four of us out of you know the 80 kids in that grade, come up to the front and sing a Jewish song for Hanukkah. Um, and we always sang, I have a little dreidel, because it was the only one that everyone knew. I thought was the worst song, it was it all in English. Very embarrassing. So do you, do you think that experience of being a, a distinct minority affected your Jewish identity later on? Absolutely. I feel that um, I've always felt I live in two worlds and that everyone looks at me and I kind of blend right in and I look like everybody else. I feel like I'm not like everybody else. Um, and I don't outwardly portray that and don't outwardly scream that at people. Um, and I. I do dress like everybody else. It isn't that I kind of set myself apart, but I feel so different um, in many aspects. How I view things, could I participate in things? Um, whether the struggle for, you know, football on Friday nights um, in my own home. Um, because you, 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 you wanted to go to the game, but you wanted to be at home? Right, or? exactly. Um, how did you, you solve it? So how we solved it was we had Friday night dinner together, and then I would go to the game afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, but it wasn't the, it doesn't really matter, you just go to the game, or it wasn't, no, you can't go to the game, stay home. Mm -hmm. So this was our kind of compromise we came up with. And then wh where did you go to college? Um, it, well, I started at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. I went there for two years. Mm -hmm. I then left and le lived in Israel for um, nine months. And then I came back and I went to University of Wisconsin in Madison. Okay, so it, all of the, those three different locations, there were a large number of Jewish students. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How did you respond to being no longer such a small minority, but a, I guess I would call it a comfortable minority? Right. So finally you could find people that um, you felt comfortable with, that you were, there was enough of a population there that we had lots of friends that were Jewish, who you had other interests besides just that you were both Jewish. Um, and it felt great to participate in lots of things and feel comfortable, um, kind of comfortable in your own skin after being kind of like, I'm trying to hide something. And, uh, talk about your nine months in Israel. How, how did that, why, first of all, why, why did you choose to go? I assume it was a junior year abroad program. So what it was is that um, I was involved in, in high school, I was involved in Young Judea. Um, and so afterwards, some of the co core people, um, that was really very influential on in my life in Young Judea. Um, high school, I just kept more and more withdrawn. I felt really alienated from the ongoings of, of high school. And the thing that kept me going was really Young Judea and my friends who lived in other cities and other parts of the country. At the end of that, there's many of my friends were going on your course. And my 
dad in particular was convinced that if I didn't go to school right away, that I would never come back. He might be right. <laughs> um, but so the deal was I'd, I'd go to school for two years and then I got to decide. So I went and I, I just went to Kibbutz Olpan by myself. And it, was this your first trip to Israel? I had been for a summer with Young Judea for mm -hmm. a summer trip as a junior in high school. And can you look back and see that that, that time in Israel affected how you view a Jewish identity, um, how you feel about being Jewish? Um, I think it, for the first time I felt like you could be Jewish and not, well, it wasn't all about your observance um, and how to really feel, live a Jewish life that felt part of a the culture of the life and not just about the laws and the religious observance. Um, and it was great. It was a really great experience. Um, it was great to meet people from all over um, and see the commonalities um, and really kind of sunk in then of like, so how do you want to live your life and how to kind of make that happen? Uh, tell me about your decision to be to become a doctor. Um, so I had went through many phases of what I would do with my life and lots of different options um, all over the board. Um, from a teacher, a journalist, I was going to be a ranger in the park system, all over the place. Um, but I think I evolved into this that I felt really strongly um, that this was the combination of things that would be good for me. Um, I liked science. I liked to teach. I wanted to do something with people. I did not want to just be about papers and paperwork and um, just ideas. I wanted to be, I wanted to touch people every day, literally touch people every day. Um, and so, and this was, I had enough different experiences that this kind of brought it together. I had this fear of going to medical school. Um, at the time, not, you know, women were a huge minority in entering in medical school. And I thought that I, I could I do it? Was I, did I have what it takes to kind of get through all that? Mm -hmm. I took some pre-med classes and it was very, um, it was not a very loving, nurturing environment and learning was very competitive and is that what I really wanted? Um, so I struggled with it, but, but then moved in this direction. Do you feel you were influenced by the, the women's movement at that time? Absolutely, and I felt I had this responsibility to push myself. Mm -hmm. That if I thought I could do it, that I should take that risk and I should push myself to do it. That it was my, I had this really responsibility that I could not say, oh, this is more comfortable. I'll do, I'll do what I like and what feels good to me. I had to do it to kind of push the, the boundaries a little bit. Were you, was your family encouraging? Absolutely, absolutely. Very encouraging, very supportive. And did, it was your medical experience medical school experience what you expected? Or, or well, I guess what I'm asking is, how, how is being a woman in, in medical school? Because this was just the brink of a, a great wave of female in it, professions. It, exactly, it really was just the brink. Um, and I, so I had, it was, I always say that I thought that once I got to medical school, it would be much better. And when I got there, I realized the same people who went to medical school were all the people that I didn't really like in the pre-med classes. Um, and it was, there were no, so it was very competitive, not a lot of camaraderie, and I felt there were no, there were very, very few um, role models, female role models. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really a man's world. Um, and we were accepted as, in a very nice, but off, I really felt like second class citizens there, but accepted, mm -hmm. not dismissed completely. Um, but you clearly had to push yourself and prove yourself over and over. Did you rely on um, the, the other women to su support each other? Some of them. And there, were, there was a small group of women who were, um, I felt, a, similar to me, um, who were really in it for what I thought were the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And then there were some women that shocked me that were, um, they really, they want to just make a lot of money. They were, and it was like, it just was <laughs> the antithesis of what I thought women would be in, the, in that profession. So going through this experience without role models or, or mentors, do you like to see yourself as a role model for the next generation? I do. And I see that in many different levels. Um, I see it as, as a woman. I see it as a mom. 
and how do you balance career and family. Um, and I see it also as my choice of profession in primary care. Um, so part of what happens in my work is that there's residents and students that come through there and I think that's a huge part of what I need to do is not just teach them the medicine but teach them to kind of model what needs to happen mm -hmm. um, and how I've kind of my experience. Mm -hmm. um, when you got out of medical school, you, your career path, you, you made a, a conscious decision to um, first of all to be a primary care physician and then to, to serve the poor. Mm -hmm. So talk about that decision and how, how that came about, your experience with, um, with Bread for the City, the, the clinic where you work. So I, um, I knew I wanted to do, to work in community, in a community setting. Um, that's really what I wanted to do. I felt that I had these, this knowledge and these skills and I wanted to make it to the, the best use possible. And it would be the places where no one wanted to go and no one wanted to practice. So I didn't want to go to a place where you could choose among one of dozens of cardiologists, but a place where nobody was there. Um, so I, when we moved to DC and I was looking for jobs, um, I ended up doing a fellowship in primary care at GW. And through that I met this amazing woman, Eve Bargman, who was running the primary care tract residency program at GW. And she took the, her residents over to this clinic, at that time called Zacchaeus Free Clinic. Um, and so I tagged along with her. Um, and that is where I felt the most comfortable in practicing medicine of all the years that I had been lots of different places in hospital, outpatient settings, inpatient settings, everything. Um, what was it about it that made you feel so at home? Um, patients came in, there was an immense amount of respect. Um, there was this thirst for knowledge when they came in. They had lots of questions. They were so appreciative of what we said. Um, so appreciative of any time you gave them. They really listened. They were like sponges because they had never had the opportunity to sit with a professional um, by themselves and ask all those questions. They're mostly relying on their aunts, their mothers, their, their friends to try and figure out their health problems. Um, or they were in some other, an emergency room setting where they would often go and not get really proper care. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it really was um, there, I, I felt really appreciated and it was really um, this great mutual relationship that we had. And you've been there how many years now? So I started working there in 1991. Um, when I was pregnant with Yona. Your youngest. My youngest. Yeah. Do, do you think this decision to, to work with the poor, yeah, it, do you consider this at all a Jewish decision? So I, it's hard to answer that question and I think the reason why, I think about it a lot, I think the reason it's hard to say is this really because I'm Jewish I'm doing this is because being Jewish and who I am are so intertwined um, that the, on one hand, no, I'm doing this because it's who I am. On the other hand, I'm doing this, of course, because I'm Jewish, because I am who I am because I'm Jewish, and I think that you can't separate out the two. Yet so many other uh, Jewish professionals, Jewish doctors, choose a different type of practice. That is true, mm -hmm. that is true. So I think it's really the values and um, my Jewish upbringing and my values that were just um, so much the core of who I am, that this is where I had to be. And this is the place I would feel I was doing the most good, that I was the most comfortable in serving here. You ever f wonder what your life would have been like had you uh, chosen a different type of practice, more lucrative? Never. Never? <laughs> You're not seduced by the glitter? Not at all. No, I never think about that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Okay. All right. Um, you have three children. I do. Talk about the, the work-home management conflict that, that all women of our generation had to deal with. Um, yeah, so it's, it's enormous. Um, so I had three kids. I had one in medical school, one in residency, um, and one right after I got out. Um, and then so it takes a clearly it takes a very supportive husband. It takes someone who's got a little bit of flexibility. Um, someone's sick. Someone has to stay home. I can't um, sometimes. So um, that's part. Of, so you have to have that great supportive home environment. Um, 
but it's it's really how do you draw lines and how do you know what's what's my life what's what's important for me professionally what's the family life um, when is it okay to to say I'm a mom and I need to take time off for this um, so it's all it's really a struggle and just when you think you figure it out the kids change and they grow and they have different needs and you have to kind of readjust mm -hmm. um, so I tried to be in a work environment that I that would be um, supportive of that as well, and I think that's really the key thing. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think men feel as guilty as women? To this at this point in time, mm -hmm. I still don't. Um, I still think that women still feel they're the primary one. That men is the number one backup. But it's still the woman's primary goal to figure out how can she reach this balance, how can she do that. Um, for in, I mean, I just feel like I want to be home every night. I never wanted to have a job that would make me travel. Um, even if I know they would be home with their dad, should that be good enough? Um, I don't know. I just felt that this is, I needed that time with my kids and I was, I needed time away and that was my professional life but I had to draw the line and I had to be home at night. Mm -hmm. um, after being on call for so many years um, and sleeping in the hospital, that was one of my key things when I got out um, to find a job where I would come home every night and sleep in my bed and be home with my kids. Now I, I know that you're, uh, you have a very strong Jewish background and obviously a very strong Jewish identity and you're very knowledgeable Jewishly and, and um, because we belong to the same synagogue, I know that you read Torah, and you do it so beautifully. Where did you learn this? Um, so I learned Torah as an adult. So. Um, and what motivated you to learn it, to, to read Torah? Um, so I'm always trying to push myself to learn a little something um, that's not part of my background. Um, my Jewish formal learning was Hebrew school and Sunday school. Um, and not tremendous. I think that most of my love of learning and some of my core values all came from my family. Um, and so as a teenager, when I was in Young Judea, I discovered this, that I could teach myself, that we as t teens in this organization, we taught each other um, all about Israel and all about Zionism and things that I'd never been exposed to before and realized that that's really my lifelong learning of Judaism. Um, so I try to learn something and push myself a little bit. Um, reading Torah is something I'd, I'd never had a bat mitzvah. So I thought this was um, something I really wanted to do. To um, have a bat mitzvah or to, to, to read, read Torah. Torah? Right, to have that skill. Why did you never have a bat mitzvah? Um, so when I was 13, it was an option for women. Um, so that was the first thing. And then I felt that um, I could learn what they had to learn, but could I really be a bat mitzvah? Could I, you know, am I going, am I learned enough? Would I take on all these responsibilities? Um, it felt almost like I was slipping in and not really participating in the whole event. Mm -hmm. um, which was interesting that I felt very strongly about that, yet if I looked at my brothers or if I looked at any of the boys that were my age, that's what they did. Mm -hmm. They kind of memorized what they had to do and then they moved on. Um, but I felt it was a huge, big, if I'm, because I had the choice, it wasn't just this is what you do and then move on. I had the choice, it was like, so I really thought about it a lot and said, I didn't know if I knew enough or who could teach me enough or how much I wanted to take on, and so I decided it wasn't right. You were a very serious 13 year old. I was a serious 13 year old, yeah. So when you read Torah, is there any special uh, feeling that you get when you do it? Is, uh, have you achieved your goal when you when you do it? I do. I actually I love to learn the Torah portion. Um, it's very nerve wracking to get up there and read it, um, but it's my I can use my Hebrew, which um, clearly is mostly from when I was on Opan. Um, so it's great that I can, and it's really amazing to read this sacred text literally from the scroll itself. It's a little bit. Um, it's a little bit mystical up there. It's a little bit, yeah. Transcendent moment. Yeah, it really, Sometimes. really is. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know you, you chose to educate your kids at, at a Jewish day school. Day school. Mm -hmm. What was involved with that decision? Um, so I grew up in public school and had this education from Sunday school and Hebrew school and felt it was, I, it was, I learned almost nothing, I felt. Um, and felt that I, the way to, continue to be Jewish is to have the knowledge. 
that if you don't have the knowledge, then you don't have anything, you don't have any basis to decide whether you want to choose or not choose to do something. Um, so I thought that it was my responsibility to give my kids that knowledge base so that they could then make the decisions on how they wanted to lead their Jewish lives. Um, and I didn't think Hebrew School and Sunday School was going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so thought that this was the best way to get them an educa a Jewish education. Mm -hmm. You still feel that way? Um, I do, but I must tell you I'm a strong believer in public education and it's a... Um, it, like my kids never had a choice about going to a private school. Um, they never had any special needs for a private school. Um, and big believer in being a part of the community in public school and so I, it was always a difficult choice. Um, it has worked out. I think that they have a great basis of what to choose from and I think that they will, whether they, however they choose to live their lives, they have this great knowledge base. Um, or they go back to learn what they really never learned, but if there's something in there that makes sense to them. Now, I, I know your husband also works in the world of the nonprofits. Mm -hmm. um, someone might think that you guys, the two of you, are, this is a very powerful, uh, he's, and he's a lawyer. Um, the choices that you've made to work in the nonprofit world is a, kind of, a, I think, a powerful example for your own children. Do they talk to you about that? Always, every day. Not as kids, obviously, mm -hmm. but as they are young adults and figuring out their lives, I think that the most influential thing on their lives was really our dinner conversations. Because um, you talk about, what'd you do today? Mm -hmm. Tell me about your day, mm -hmm. was, the, was the joke that we would say. Mm -hmm. um, or as I can say, talk about my day when they were very little. Um, yeah, this is really what we did and what we, what we felt strongly enough this is where we where we were and where we were going to stay. We were not just kind of checking it out and passing through. This was really our life commitment to this kind of work. Um, huge influence on them, feeling that they are need to um, be involved in the world, involved in their community, um, and be an active member. Mm -hmm. so. Do you see, are any of them following in your, in your footsteps? Um, so I think it will be interesting to see where they all end up. Um, I, we have one daughter in law school um, who wants to work either, probably in government is what she wants to do. Our second daughter works for a nonprofit in New York doing paralegal work. Um, she will probably be, end up in the nonprofit world in some way. Um, although we were teasing her that we thought she should go to medical school and she said, I'm still young, anything could happen, although that is really not her leanings. Um, and then our youngest wants to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. I, I know you have a very strong work, work ethic. You work long hours at, at the clinic. You have a, a lot of patients to see. Um, what what are, do you consider the biggest challenges of your work? Um, the biggest challenges for the work itself or mm -hmm. for me? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, probably the inequities in the system um, is probably the biggest challenge. And for getting patients not to focus on their inequities um, is probably the biggest challenge. I feel that they feel like if they had better insurance, if they had more um, money to access different resources, they would lead a different, their health would be better. They would have a different life. Um, I and think that's that is, not true. Um, to some extent it's true. Um, to, put, to a large extent it's how to make the most of what you have and I to focus on that as opposed to focus on what I don't have. So is, is working with the poor different? Are the, are the poor different than people who have means um, in, the, in, the, in that sense? That they, no, they're not. That they want, everyone wants what some, the, someone else about has more than you mm -hmm. have and everyone wants if they can have it, why can't I have it? I think that that's probably very true of everyone. Um, but how to... So I, I guess that that is true, but I feel like uh, they... Sometimes you can't do something about that, so let's think about what you... Let's focus in and put your energy on what you can do something about. Um, and sometimes I feel like people with resources feel like, I can conquer this, I can do this, I'm going to, you know, 
of course, if I had more money or more resources, I could do more. But they feel that they have enough that they can do, get what they need done. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel, the poor feel like, this is what, um, this is where I'm at. I can't do anything about it. They don't feel empowered to make any, even personal choices that could make a difference. Um, you think this is lack of, that, that education is power as well as money? If it's an access? So a part, clearly, education is part of it, but I also feel like there's a large um, feeling among poor that they feel, they feel oppressed. They really feel, and that really weighs on them mm -hmm. every decision and everything they make. Mm -hmm. So it's hard. It's hard to believe and it's hard to have hope. You feel like you're at the bottom. What would you, you tell what would you like people who are not poor to know about the poor? Um, first of all, I'd say the most amazing part of poor people and my, jo my job that I have insight into them is the amazing strength that they have, that they're sto they are full of these amazing stories um, that would surprise you. Um, stories about their life experiences. Their life experience, where they've been, what they have overcome to get where they are. Mm -hmm. um, and you may think that they are at the bottom and they have nothing, but they have really done something to get where they are at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really great. And I have, whether it's um, many new immigrant stories are really truly amazing. Um, and you kind of, Sometimes you just see a row of people and they all look the same and you forget they have really unique stories, each one of them. And this guy, he's not doing anything you told him what to do, but in the meantime, what he's doing to support his niece or something else is really, truly amazing. Mm -hmm. um, very, very strong sense of community and family um, that I think that people who are not poor in this country become more about themselves and more about me, it's all me and what can I get for myself. Um, and these guys are really, maybe the reason why they're still poor is that whatever they get, they share. Um, and because there's a very strong sense of, it's not, I'm not in this alone, that we are in this together. Mm -hmm. what, what have you learned from uh, your work with these people? So I, the importance of community um, is enormous. Um, the importance of recognizing that and saying, recognizing each individual to let them know what they've accomplished that is so great, um, to not let moments go by that you don't say, give them that recognition, give them the encouragement, give them, say thank you, um, have been really huge, huge things that keep me going mm -hmm. um, and really are pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Do your patients know that you're Jewish? Many do. Um, I don't tell them that, but sometimes they will ask me. Um, I get blessed many times during the day. Bless you, bless you. Um, but some people will say, you know, do you believe? Who's your God? You know, right? Um, or holiday time, they want to know. Mm -hmm. So they do. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they try to convert you? Never? Never, never, never try to convert me. Um, but you know they all. So they all have. They have different. Different people have different reactions. Of course, um, some, whatever. It's fine. And others can be. Um, oh, what does that mean? And get very. Can be somewhat concerned. What that means. Um, Do you ever have Jewish patients? Rarely. Very, very rarely. In the city. Right. Um, when when you're feeling in in need of inspiration, where where do you get the inspiration to get out of bed and, and do it all again the next day? Um, if ever. If ever. So I think, you know, you... Getting out of bed sometimes is hard, <laughs> um, but it feels, once you're up and moving and just lucky that you've got all these, um, that you're there, it feels really good. Do you think it takes a certain personality to work with the poor? Yes. Definitely, definitely. I feel that you have to be um, that great balance of pushing people and letting them understand what, what's going on, pushing them to get themselves to kind of move to that next level without being frustrated with that. Mm 
Um, this is not my burden, and I try and explain that to them. Um, but this is, I'm there to help them and guide them and assist them. Um, but it really does take a lot of, it's a, it, it is a, the right personality has to do this job. Um, do, you, do you have any, um, uh, a message for the next generation of, of, of uh, Jewish women doctors? What would you tell a young, a young woman graduating from medical school? Um, they should think about why they went to medical school and think about their overall values to figure out what they need to do. Um, and I think that um, you should, whatever you choose to do, you should be happy in doing it. Um, but, and you should make sure that you've got that right balance um, with, between your work and your family um, before you move on. Uh, you are a, a very uh, humble person. Mm -hmm. People who don't know you don't know all the wonderful things you do for this community. Uh, where does that come from? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's not about me. It's really, it's really, I have just been lucky to be a part of this, gr uh, a great organization and be involved with amazing patients um, that I can work with them um, to do what I can do. Do you learn from them? Absolutely. Every day. Every day. They amaze me um, and teach me things about the importance of life and family and community and the importance of history. Um, and where we all come from. Personal history. Personal family history, history, family mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. So that, and it's our responsibility to keep that going and figure out what the right thing, what the right next steps are. Okay. Uh, last question. To someone looking at, looking at your life who doesn't really know you, you know, you performing so many mitzvot, taking care of the poor, taking care of the sick, uh, having great humility, educating your children Jewishly, your own Jewish observance. This looks like a true exemplary Jewish life. Are you conscious of that at all? Not at all. <laughs> now that you lay it out there like that, it's like, who, who are you talking about? I think you flipped a page and they're the wrong thing. No, not at all. It's just who I am. It's what I do. Um, I'm lucky. I've got great kids. I've got a great family. A lot of support from my larger family, my cousins and my aunts and uncles and my dad. Um, yeah, and it, I'm really, I have this amazing community at work. Um, a lot of love. I get more hugs during the day from my patients. I'm just lucky. Um, that it makes me feel really a part of what's happening. Um, and I work with this great staff that says, this is what we're doing we need to do better. What can we do? Everyone is really pushing themselves and thinking it through and nobody is just cruising and hoping, you know, and just trying to slide by it all. So it's a great, it's a great, really great combination. Yeah. So you're, you feel lucky. I feel lucky. Yeah. Anything you'd like to add? I don't think okay. so. Thank you, Randy. Okay.